Welcome everybody to our lecture for the UCLA Meteorite Gallery. Uh, this is a monthly lecture, the third Sunday of each month. Uh, when, when you register for one lecture, I think you're registered for all of them. Uh, this, the details will be handled by our uh, moderator, Juliet Hook, uh, who will be coming in from time to time. Anyway, today I'm delighted uh, that we have a speaker, Tasha Dunn from Colby College. Uh, this is in rural Maine, in Waterville, Maine. Uh, and I'm pleased to have her here. I've known her for a few years. Uh, she uh, got her bachelor's degree in geology at Tulane down in New Orleans. Um, and she worked in environmental consultation for a few years. She, she returned to graduate school at University of Tennessee where she worked with the fabled Hat McSween over there. Um, and she was interested in solar system geology and planetary geology for a long time. And I see that she went as an assistant professor at Illinois State um, in, um, is, that, is that normal, uh, Tasha? Yeah, yeah I, I went to Urbana, so, um, but I never really got around to normal. Anyway, uh, she's uh, been working on a lot of uh, things, she's interested in Mars, I believe, and she's working on carbonaceous chondrites. Um, and uh, she, let's see. She has a number of graduate students, uh, and, well, actually undergraduate students, and she's been publishing with them. She's currently the treasurer of the Meteoritical Society, a job that I once had and Kevin once had. Uh, and uh, there she has an asteroid, 8999, named after her. I see that she's also the uh, Claire Booth Luce assistant. She was the Claire Booth Luce assistant professor of geology. Um, it's um, the Booth Luce Foundation. It does a lot of different things. And one of the programs that they do that is named after her, and you'll have to, you can tell us a little bit about her, um, is a program for uh, assist, female assistant professors in STEM to help them get to tenure. And so when I was uh, pre-tenured here at Colby, I had that, that designation. Uh, she was the wife of Henry Luce, the publisher of Time Magazine. Uh, mm -hmm. She was an ambassador. She wrote a rather a provocative play called The Women uh, at one point, and she was a conservative a voice and a strong anti-communist in her um, dealings at the time. But anyway, that aside, uh, she's now uh, not Claire Booth Luce, but Tasha is an <laughs> professor of geology at Colby College in Waterville, Maine, and today she's going to uh, talk about it's getting hot in here, metamorphism of primitive solar system materials. We'll jump right into it. And today I want to talk a little bit about metamorphism of carbonaceous chondrites primarily, or all chondrites really. But we're going to start at the very beginning and do a little bit of background. I think some of you who have uh, been uh, participating in this series for in the last several months are probably a little bit aware of some of the background. But, you know, for those of you who aren't, we'll start, start just by talking a little bit about uh, what meteorites are, and I think most of you probably know that they're technically just pieces of other planetary bodies that have landed on Earth. But I think when uh, when most people think about meteorites, they they imagine a very specific kind of rock in their head, and so they probably imagine something that looks like this. So this is an iron meteorite. Uh, iron meteorites are very heavy, and so they stand out from other materials around them. And when people can pick up something very heavy, they immediately think this is a this is a strange thing, and this is made primarily of metal. Uh, they tend to also be relatively black and shiny on the outside and sometimes have these little divots in them as well. And that's a pretty standard type of meteorite, at least the way that most people imagine it. But the thing about meteorites is that there are actually a really wide variety of meteorites. So not all meteorites are made just of iron. Some meteorites are made of iron and other materials. And this is an example of a palisite. So it's primarily iron, but you can see little crystals here of a mineral called olivine, which is really ubiquitous in the solar system. This is a chondrite, which we'll talk primarily about chondrites today. Very, very different from what you probably imagine when you think of a meteorite, and also very different from what you think of when you just imagine a rock, a terrestrial rock from Earth. They are very, very different um, in what they are made of and how they look, and we'll talk about those differences today. This is an example of an HED meteorite, which is from the asteroid Cor Vesta, and this looks very much like a terrestrial igneous rock. So it looks like something that may have formed from a volcanic eruption here on Earth, but it is in fact from outer space. And this is an angrite. So again, a very terrestrial looking rock, but still a rock from outer space. So a really wide variety in the meteorite collection. And actually only a very small percentage are iron meteorites. Most are actually chondrites. 
So some media rights come from, ban from uh, planetary bodies that are what we call differentiated. And so differentiated is a, is a, is a fancy science word basically for a body that has been um, divided into chemical layers. And uh, that happens because of heat in the early solar system. And so what happens is that your, your, you know, your silicate minerals, like basically what rock are made of primarily, and the metal in these bodies will separate physically so that the metal goes to the center and the, uh, the lighter silicate materials fill in the middle and what we call the crust. And so the Earth, of course, is a differentiated body, as are the terrestrial planets like Mars, for example, the most famous probably of the terrestrial bodies, especially it's on everybody's mind right now. The moon is also a differentiated planet. Um, and this is an example here of asteroid 4 Vesta, which is one of the, the only few known differentiated asteroids in the solar system. So the interesting thing about these differentiated bodies is that when we get meteorites from them, we're basically sampling, sampling different locations within that body. So those iron meteorites, for example, represent pieces of the core, which is really, you know, really interesting and um, useful to us as well, because if we think about what the core of the Earth looks like, that's not a thing we could actually visualize or sample directly in any kind of way whatsoever. But using meteorites, then we have an idea of what our core would look like as well. Those uh, palisites I mentioned a little while ago, the ones that have the iron and the olivine, those come from what we believe to be the core mantle boundary. So basically the area um, right between those two layers, the core where we get the metal from, and then the mantle is where we would get the, the olivine from, the silicate minerals. And again, that's super fascinating to think that we're able to sample that particular region of a planetary body, not a place we'd be able to see inside our own Earth. So that's pretty, it's, it's mind boggling, I think, sometimes to think about it. And then most of the meteorites that come from these differentiated planetesimals are crustal material, or either maybe up on, upper mantle a little bit. These are the HEDs, which are the Howardites, Huprites, and Diogenites, and those are all derived from the crust of asteroid 4 Vesta. So really interesting rocks give us really important information about planet forming processes. But most meteorites actually don't come from planetary bodies, they come from uh, undifferentiated asteroids, so unmelted asteroids that are primarily located in what we call the asteroid belt. And so the asteroid belt is a region of space between Mars and Jupiter. It's about three AU wide, and an AU is the distance from the Earth to the Sun, so three times that distance. So it's a very large region of space. It's populated by at least a half a million asteroids, and that number is probably in reality closer to a million, but we haven't quite found them all yet. Uh, the ones that are left are very small, so they're a little bit harder to, uh, to identify. But a lot of material, um, the strange thing about the asteroid belt, though, is that even though there is a lot of material, it's actually not really a lot. Like, we think of a half a million bodies as being uh, a, a lot of objects, but it's only about 4% the mass of the, of the moon. And so that's a, a real small total mass of material, and one-third of that is the asteroid Ceres, which is the largest of all asteroids. So you could be on an asteroid in the asteroid belt looking out into space and not see another asteroid. So this is very different from what they show us in sci-fi movies when you're, you're, you know, you're flying in your spacecraft through the asteroid belt and there's all these rocks coming at you from all directions. It would never happen. You could look out every direction, you wouldn't see anything else. So it's very sparsely populated. The bodies in the asteroid belt are for the most part relatively small. Uh, these are, and you can see that they're also very oddly shaped, and that's because you have to be a certain size, about 500 kilometers in diameter, to uh, to become spherical. So these small objects just retain very unusual, sometimes even elongated shapes. So we call these undifferentiated asteroids primitive, and we call them primitive because they contain the oldest solid, the oldest solids in the solar system. And so that's where the word primitive come from. So this is, exist this is material that would have existed even before the planets formed. And the type of meteorite that is derived from those primitive asteroids is called chondrites. And so that's what I'll be talking about today. You can see that chondrites look very different from earth rocks. We're gonna talk about all these individual components. And so you'll see what chondrules and matrix in CAIs means in just a minute. But first, let's talk about the different kinds of chondro chondrites, just to give ourselves kind of, uh, so we're, we're all at the same place in terms of uh, the, the language here. There are three primary classes of, car of chondrites, the carbonaceous, ordinary, and instatite. The ordinary chondrites are by far the most prolific of all the chondrites. So that's where they actually get their name, ordinary, because they're the most common. And they're divided into three groups based on the abundance of iron. So H is high iron, L is low, and LL is actually lower iron 
than the low iron group. Um, the instatite chondrites are chondrites that are made primarily of the mineral instatite, which is a pyroxene. And so there's a high iron and low iron group of instatite chondrites as well. And then we have the carbonaceous chondrites where we have the most different groups of carbonaceous chondrites. The word carbonaceous is a little bit of a misnomer in terms of their classification. They really don't have a lot of carbon with the exception of the CIs, which are the most primitive chondrites in the entire solar system. Uh, but that name has kind of stuck around as we started to discover other chondrite groups um, uh, as you know, in history as, as that took place. There are a couple of ungrouped classes or ungrouped groups, I should say, the Rs and the Ks that don't fit into carbonaceous, ordinary, or instatype. But if you look at all these images here, what you'll notice again about the chondrites is that they don't look anything like rocks that you would see on Earth. You would never find anything on Earth that looks like this. And again, that's because they're composed of these early solar system components, which on planets like Earth have been physically destroyed by the process of differentiation. So looking at these components, looking at these chondrites is really like looking um, at a window right back into time, back into the solar system when it first formed. So let's look at all these components individually because what I'm gonna talk about today is how these components change as we heat an asteroid. So we'll understand them a little bit first. And I'm gonna start with chondrules. Uh, chondrules are the, the, the part of the chondrite by which they got their name, you can imagine, right? Chondrules and chondrites. Uh, chondrules means seed in Greek. And what you're looking at here are two-dimensional slices. So these are slices of uh, samples of meteorites. And so if you, the chondrules can be recognized by the fact that they're very round. And so there are a lot of very round objects in both of these images. But if we were to look at that in three dimensions, we'd see they're actually spherical. And they're spherical because we believe that they formed from a liquid, formed from molten material that would have cooled very rapidly. And so they retained that circular, that spherical shape as they cooled very quickly, kind of like sleet, I imagine. Um, I use that as an analogy when it comes down onto the surface. So chondrules are typically millimeter to centimeter size. They can be smaller sometimes. They can be a, bit, a little bit bigger sometimes as well. But you can see by these images here just how common chondrules are in many different types of chondrite groups. One other component you can see in this image, uh, the darker material is what we call matrix. And matrix material is basically everything that kind of fits in between these other components. Uh, so it appears very dark in these images, which again are images of slices or image of, images of thin sections. Uh, so you can distinguish that relatively easy from the chondrules. So there are different types of chondral textures that give us information about how they formed and in particular how they cooled. And just a couple of examples. And what I'm showing you here are images that are uh, taken under a microscope and they were taken with cross polarized light, which means that we're able to control the vibration and direction of the light and so everything in these images looks very different from how it actually looks to the naked eye. And so everything is very colorful and that's because of the way that we're controlling the light. So you can see the crystals a little bit more clearly. So everything looks a little like disco balls to me, I think. But for example, porphyritic chondrules, porphyritic is a word that means you have large grains surrounded by very, very small grains or fine grain matrix is the word we would use in geology. And so this is a porphyritic olivine chondrule. This is a porphyritic pyroxene chondrule. And so we know that those solidify from partially molten droplets. Something like a barred olivine or a radial pyroxene uh, chondral would have solidified from a molten droplet. So lots of different kinds of chondrules are really beautiful to look at. Um, and some people for their entire careers basically just study chondrules. They're very interesting uh, igneous features in these bodies. I wanna show you another set of images of chondrules because this illustrates something called the mesostasis. And the mesostasis is shown here in blue. So these are false color images. The image here on the left is a backscattered electron image. And so that's the way we can look at a, a meteorite under a very high resolution microscope called a scanning electron microscope. And uh, the darker the area, the more low in iron it is and the higher, the, the brighter it is, the higher it happens to be in iron. And so these are false color maps that are made from some BSE images. And so again, what is important here is the light blue color, which is a mesostasis. And so mesostasis is basically material that forms in between or around the larger olivine and instatite grains. Now these are all chondrules from an instatite chondrite, which is why they're made primarily of the mineral instatite. In most other chondrite groups, they'd be primarily olivine. But you can see that mesostasis relatively well. So again, kind of analogous to a matrix 
in a whole rock sample. But we'll talk more about that a little bit later, but I wanted to point that out. Another really important component of chondrites is called uh, refractory inclusions or more specifically calcium aluminum inclusions. And so in this image here on the left, which is a slice of, of the CB chondrite in Yende, you can see the CAI stand out very, uh, very well as these bright white objects. They're kind of amoeboid in shape. So they look very different in terms of their shape than the chondrules do. This is an image here that is a RGB map or an RGB image. And uh, RGB image is actually three different images that are combined. And each one of those image highlights a different elemental composition. And so in this case, red is magnesium, blue is aluminum, and green is calcium. So the CAI stand out because they are composed primarily of calcium and aluminum minerals. And so they look teal basically in terms of their coloration. All of the chondrules, which again are primarily olivine and pyroxene, very magnesium rich, so those are all red. Calcium lumen inclusions are really important because they are the oldest solids in the solar system. So the very first thing to condense from the solar nebula, that's 4.567 billion years ago. And that's actually how we get the age of the solar system. It's derived from the age of CAIs. These are two other backscatter electron images just to show you a little bit more, uh, more close up high resolution image of what these CAIs look like. And so on the one on the left, for example, you can see the darker color here, that's the mineral spinel. The lighter color mineral is melilite. And so both of those are magnesium, calcium, and aluminum rich phases that would have been early condensing phases in the solar system. And this is kind of a close-up image of that. And then the last chondrite component is metal. And so metal is not something you find in all chondrites, but you find it a lot in ordinary chondrites and incitite chondrites. Um, in this case too, the top image here is a CR chondrite and the bottom is a CB, or sorry, a CH chondrite. So there are a couple of carbonaceous chondrite groups where you would find some metal too, but it's certainly not as common. Um, metal is just, just metal, it's just iron nickel metal primarily. And you can see that it's spread heterogeneously throughout the entire sample as it would be in the early solar system. So let's talk about how we make all of these components. We also sometimes refer to them as ingredients. So how do we make all the ingredients of our chondrites that we're then gonna find a way to alter and metamorphose and heat up? I have to go all the way back to the solar nebula. Solar nebula was a giant cloud of gas and dust. Um, as that class, I'm sorry, as that cloud began to cool, then the components or the ingredients began to condense out of that cloud. And this is a little bit tricky for, for people to wrap their head around sometimes because you're making a solid from a gas, which is not typically the way we think of making solids. We would think of making solids primarily from liquids, like for example, with a magma. A magma is a, is a pretty good analogy. Uh, magma is molten rock. And if you wanna turn that into solid rock, you have to cool it. And so as you cool the solid, or sorry, as you cool the liquid or the molten rock, it crystallizes and becomes a solid. Um, so the solar nebula basically works the same way. Another thing about uh, the formation or the, the formation of all these components from the solar nebula that's also like how we make crystals from magma is that not all minerals form in a magma at the same time. And that's because they all have different melting temperatures or different crystallization temperatures. So there are minerals that are gonna form first in a magma and minerals that would form later at lower temperatures. And so the solar nebula works in the same way. And so there are components like the calcium aluminum rich minerals that form at very high temperatures that would come out first. And then those lower temperature phases would come out afterwards. So as the nebula cools, we go through this process of condensation. We make refractory inclusions, metal grains, and then we make matrix. That's basically the order of condensation. Now chondrules formed a little bit later, probably one to two million years after CAIs through some enigmatic process that we don't quite necessarily understand completely. I know Alan gave a talk I think in December about chondral formation. And there's a lot of different hypotheses for how we make chondrules. There's even a hypothesis that they would have formed directly from the solar nebula. Um, so that's, a, of course, a whole different topic of conversation. But for now, we're just going to, to, to understand the fact that we have chondrules by some mechanism, by some way. And so now we have all these components floating around in the solar system. And they basically have to find each other if they want to form larger bodies. And so that process of forming larger bodies from small material is called accretion. So we're going to accrete these larger bodies. So just a quick uh, a little background about accretion. Again, it's a process of going from very small material to larger and larger objects. The process of accretion is driven by different 
forces depending on the size of the material. So very small size material like these CAIs and these chondrules would accrete together via weak electrostatic forces that basically they, they find each other and they are pulled together. This is basically analogous to what happens in your house when you make a dust bunny, right? We have a lot of dust around our houses, no matter how much we tend to clean or try to clean. And those little pieces of dust have very, very weak electrostatic charges. And so they eventually will find each other, join together. And the next thing you know, you've got a giant dust bunny uh, in, the, in the corner of your house. And so it's the same process pulling these objects together. As they get bigger into a planetesimal stage, so by the time we're at tens of kilometers to hundreds of kilometers, the force that's driving that accretion is a random uh, collision, right? So random collisions are driving that accretion. And as those planetesimals get bigger, then it becomes more gravity driven. And so we end up with just a, a few planets in the end because of a process called runaway growth. And so basically what that means is that some of these planetesimals got large enough to um, have real strong gravitational fields. And so they attracted more and more and more material. And so they grew very quickly because they had high gravity. And so that's how we end up with the four terrestrial planets. So the parent asteroids of these primitive meteorites probably reached the planetesimal stage. Uh, they certainly um, would not have gotten really bigger than that, or, or they might have accreted to form larger material that became planets that, again, would have been destroyed by differentiation. So the objects we're thinking about and studying are in the planetesimal size, size range. So here's the interesting where things start to get interesting. So even though these primitive asteroids didn't melt, that doesn't mean that nothing happened to them. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that they didn't experience any kind of um, alteration process. There are actually a few different types of what we call secondary alteration that could have happened on these asteroids and primarily during that accretion process as we start to get to planetesimal size. And the first process is uh, impact events. And again, impacts were very, very common during the early solar system. There's a lot of material floating around. So some of the things that can happen when two bodies impact each other is you can have shock metamorphism, which is not the kind of metamorphism I'm gonna talk about today, but that is a very high pressure, high temperature, short-lived metamorphism. So like a, with a big bang, uh, you get shock metamorphism. The only way you get shock metamorphism on earth is with an impact event or a nuclear bomb. So that's the temperature or pressure range we're thinking about. You can have little pockets of melting when two bodies collide with each other as well. Again, not to melt the whole body, but to melt little pockets. Uh, brecciation is another process or, uh, or another effect you would say of impacting. And so that means you, know, you basically, basically break the object up into real small pieces that kind of accrete back together and they're more fragmented looking. And then the last thing, which is a, a thing that I've actually become very interested in over the last few years is mixing. And so one thing that can happen when two asteroids collide with each other, if it's a very low velocity collision, the material from that collision doesn't go very far. And so gravity pulls it back together. And so you end up with a new object, a new body that contains pieces of both of those asteroids. And so I've gotten really um, into finding chondrites that have other pieces of chondrites in them. And that's a, a great thing I like to study. They're great student projects. So here's an ordinary chondrite with a different kind of chondrite clasped here in the middle. So lots of things can happen when you have impact events. Another type of secondary process, processing is aqueous alteration, very similar to what we see on Earth. That's a change in the composition of a rock due to interaction with water or ice. Uh, we would probably expect this to happen, or we do see this most on carbonaceous chondrites. Uh, those are chondrites that we believe to have formed further out in the solar system, so in regions where it was colder, so ice could have accreted on the surface and maybe eventually melted, and that would be the source of the water. And so just very, you know, very briefly, a couple of things that would happen is we have a change in mineralogy, we have a change in texture. So an unaltered chondral would look something like this, which is that's a pretty standard porphyritic chondral. But if you alter it with water, you change its mineralogy and you also change the texture quite a bit. Um, and aqueous alteration is a very, very complex process and there's a lot you could say about that. So I, I will leave that to other people. I actually think there was just a talk in November, I think Adrian Burley talked a little bit about aqueous alteration. But, uh, but what I wanna do, the process that I wanna talk about most is, uh, is this metamorphism. And so metamorphism is also a change in mineralogy and texture, but it is a solid state change that results from an increase in temperature and pressure, uh, at least on earth temperature and pressure. 
So if we think about how we would recognize rocks that have been metamorphosed on Earth, we might look for types of deformation features like folding, for example, that would indicate that two rocks have been squished together and likely metamorphosed. Uh, this is a myelinization texture. This is a fault brecciation. And all of these are different textures that result from an increase in pressure and temperature. So they're all things that we would look for on Earth that would tell us that a rock has been metamorphosed. Another really common texture that we would recognize in rocks on Earth that have been metamorphosed is called foliation. And foliation is a preferential alignment of minerals. So if you imagine like an igneous rock, for example, minerals are randomly oriented, so there's, there's no alignment to them. But if you put that igneous rock under directed pressure, in this case, it's coming from the sides, uh, all of those minerals would then be squished together and would end up in this nice alignment. Think about taking a um, like a, a ball of silly putty or something, putting it between your hands and pushing, you would flatten the ball of silly putty. And so basically the same thing is happening here. It's a flattening or an alignment of the mineral grains. And that, recur that occurs because of pressure. Another type of textural change that we see in rocks on earth that have been metamorphosed is called a granoblastic texture. Uh, this is a texture that forms when rocks have been metamorphosed just by temperature. And so if you put a rock under higher temperature and you increase that temperature, the, the primary thing that is going to happen to the rock in terms of a textural change to the mineral grains is going to be that they're going to get bigger and they're all going to become more of the same size. And so the, the, the shape becomes a little bit more uniform. And you can recognize a granoblastic texture in a metamorphic rock very well by the 120 degree triple junction. And so all of the grains uh, between, like the angle between them is 120 degrees. And then lastly, perhaps the most important thing is a change in mineralogy. Um, and that, occur, that occurs because not all minerals are stable at the same pressure and temperature range. So when you heat up a rock, what you're going to do then is make those minerals unstable. And so they're going to chemically react and turn into new minerals that are stable. And so mineralogy or mineralogical changes are driven by an increase in temperature, no pressure is involved. And these are sped up by the presence of a fluid. So these are the ways that we would recognize a metamorphic rock on Earth, and we might imagine that we'd be looking for similar things in chondrites. So pressure on asteroids, however, is negligible. And so when we talk about metamorphism on asteroids, it's a thermal metamorphism. So it's a temperature-only metamorphism. I like to use a heat miser here from the old Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer uh, animations back in the, the late 60s. Uh, to represent that because they're just hot, so there's no pressure. Where is that heat coming from? That heat is coming from radioactive decay of aluminum-26. Aluminum-26 is a short-lived radioactive isotope. Radioactive isotopes are unstable in nature, and so they always want to break down or decay into a stable element. In this case, the stable daughter product is magnesium-26. That decay has a half-life of about 700,000 years. And so half-life is a way that we refer to the amount of time it takes for half of that material to decay. So after about 14 million years, all of this aluminum-26 would go away. And so that's the time frame we're talking about for when this heating would have primarily occurred. So as the uh, aluminum-26 breaks down to magnesium-26, it releases heat as a result of that reaction. And so what we end up with in the interior of our asteroid is something that looks like this. These are not chemical layers like the core, the mantle, and the crust. These different layers here represent different temperatures that were achieved during metamorphism. And so the material that achieved the highest temperatures during metamorphism would be in the center of the body. And then the temperature would decrease as we go toward the exterior because again, heat would be lost at the surface and would escape away to space. So the material in the center would have experienced the highest temperatures and the highest degree of metamorphism. And we call this an onion shell model. So we've been able to put together a, 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 a scale, basically, a way of describing just how metamorphosed samples are. And so this actually was done in the late 60s by Van Schmoos and Wood. And so this is called a petrologic type scale. And I'll refer to these numbers a lot, a lot as the talk continues. But petrologic type, again, refers to degrees of metamorphism. So type 6 would be material that has been heated the most and experienced the highest temperatures. Uh, then we go down to type five, then four, and then three would be the material very close to the surface that experienced very low degrees of metamorphism. 
Now, this type three material is really important to us as a petrologist to study uh, metamorphism in chondrites because it's very, very sensitive to those early stages of metamorphism. And so because of that, we actually divide petrologic type three into subtypes from 3.0 to 3.9. It's that sensitive. So we can really see and understand metamorphism at those very low temperatures. Now it's worth noting that um, these onion shell asteroids may not have necessarily been onion shells for very long. And again, that's because remember the early sister, the early solar system was very, very chaotic. So a lot of them would have been broken apart by impact events, reaccreted together to make uh, what we call a rubble pile. Um, Itakawa, which has been uh, studied quite a bit by uh, missions to uh, that particular asteroid is a very good example of a rubble pile asteroid. And you can tell when you look at it, it looks very loose and there are boulders on the surface that look like they're very weakly held to the surface. Uh, so that means that the body would look something like this, broken apart and comes back together. So all ordinary and instatite chondrites have been metamorphosed from that full range from type three to type six. The R's and the K's have been metamorphosed a little bit, petrologic type three. And then the carb carbonaceous chondrites, which are the ones that have been the most interest to me, um, since graduate school or after graduate school, I would say, uh, are mostly actually aqueously altered, but there are four groups of carbonaceous chondrites that have been metamorphosed, the CO, CV, CKs, and CHs. So the only group of carbonaceous chondrites that experience that full range of metamorphism, though, are the CKs. Everything has been metamorphosed to petrologic type other than that. So how does metamorphism affect these different components in, chondri uh, in chondrites? What kind of things will we look for uh, to know that our chondrite has been metamorphosed. Well, the first change is probably the most obvious, uh, and that's recrystallization. And so recrystallization um, is just a change in the texture of the, of the object. And in chondrites, what happens during recrystallization is it's mostly recrystallization of the matrix, uh, turning the matrix from a very, very fine grain material to, again, a much larger grain material, because again, that happens during metamorphism when you increase the temperature. And so this is an image here of a petrologic type three ordinary chondrite, again, a thin section in regular light. And so you can see chondrules very well, it's very easy to recognize. And then the dark material, that's matrix. So the two of those are very easy to see. But as you increase the metamorphism, so to four and then to five, for example, that matrix starts to become much more uh, coarse grain. And when that happens, the, the darker part of it like, disappears, right, because it's turned into a larger grain crystal. And those boundaries between matrix and chondrules start to become much more difficult to see. Like I can tell that there was a chondral right here, but it's very hard to recognize that that's the case. And then by the time we get to petrologic type six, all of that material has been recrystallized and there is no way to delineate chondrules anymore. So it's completely recrystallized. So here's another example of what that looks like with the instatite chondrites. This is a type three, which looks very much like the chondrites I've shown you so far. And here's a type six. And that's a very, very, very different texture than what we see in a low grade uh, chondrite. So it's completely recrystallized. Here are some examples of the CK chondrites. And the CK chondrites are the chondrites that, that I love the most and I spend all my time studying. So here's a type three, four, five, and six. And so again, you can see as you increase the metamorphism, the chondrules start to disappear basically, right? Because everything is recrystallizing. And by the time you get to type six, you can't really see chondrules very well anymore. Now, another change that happens in the carbonaceous chondrites with metamorphism is that the CAIs, the calcium aluminum inclusions, also disappear during metamorphism because they are also becoming recrystallized. And so you don't see those very much past petrologic type four. So recrystallization is really the, um, the easiest change during metamorphism to recognize, but the more prominent changes during metamorphism are changes that take place in the mineralogy. So it's changes in the chemistry of the minerals that are happening, happening as we increase the temperature. And so the, like, the best way to determine how metamorphosed a chondrite sample has been is by looking at the homogeneity of olivine. And that basically means how uniform are the compositions of olivine. So is the olivine similar um, or is it a wide range of compositions? And what happens during metamorphism, and again, this is primarily taking place during petrologic type three, is the sample is becoming equilibrated, meaning that you start off with a wide range of compositions of olivine that will all move towards an equilibrated value at 
basically petrologic type four when they get to that equilibrated state. So there are a couple of different ways to see this. You can visualize it by looking at histograms. And so a histogram basically indicates to us how common a value is. So this is olivine in a CK 3.6 slash 3.7 chondrite. Um, and so olivine has a wide range of compositions from phthalate zero all the way up to phthalate 40. Phthalate is a measure of the, of the iron content, uh, basically, of a chondrite. So it's a very wide range of iron content. As we increase the metamorphism to type 3.8 and then 3.9, what you can see happening is that you don't have as many values at that lower phthalite content. They're all kind of moving towards higher phthalite, which is moving towards an equilibration value. So a lot more equilibrated here. And then by the time you get to petrologic type four, it's completely equilibrated. Almost all of these values are phthalite 31. And so that's the equilibration value for phthalite in the CK chondrites. It's different for every chondrite group though. You could also look at this quantitatively using something called PMD. And so you'll often see chondrites refer, described as their PMD, that's percent mean deviation, which basically just means it's a number that tells you how much um, difference there is between the values of the numbers um, because of the deviation from the average. And so if you have a wide range of values, you have a big deviation. If you have a very small range of values, you have a small deviation. So just for example, this has a PMD of 17.1 and this has a PMD of one. And so we move towards a PMD of one during that process of equilibration. There are other elements of the chemistry of olivine that are also changing and becoming more equilibrated during metamorphism. Calcium does this, chromium does this. This is an illustration of how calcium changes in chondrules during metamorphism. And so you can see that it uh, becomes again, more equilibrated and also decreases in terms of abundance. So FeO is going up during metamorphism CaO is going down during metamorphism. And this is specifically in the chondrules, so in chondral olivine. Why is this happening? Well, this is happening because of a process called diffusion. Uh, diffusion is basically a, a migration of atoms. It's a mass migration of atoms between elements in a rock. And so in this case, the elements are the chondrules and the matrix and the refractory inclusions uh, but primarily probably chondrules and matrix material. So the elements like FeO and CeO and Cr203 are moving between these different components during metamorphism. So I'm gonna show you an example of what that looks like using a terrestrial rock. And so this is a garnet. And this is a garnet that's experienced a very low degree of metamorphism. And so it's actually, it has a, a zoning, a compositional zoning um, and this is magnesium in particular, uh, indicating that the magnesium is higher towards the edge, higher is red and lower is blue and green. So it's higher towards the edge and lower in the center. And you can see that here as well. That's like a profile of composition throughout the grain. As we increase the metamorphism, that zoning is going to change. And you can see that our magnesium is starting to flatten out a little bit, but that's a very different zoning pattern than what we just started with. And if we metamorphose that a little bit more, what's happened is it's become homogeneous. And so the magnesium is the same throughout that entire garnet grain. You can tell by looking at the color, which is all primarily green or yellowish. And you can see looking at this line here, it's also flattened out. Uh, so that's what diffusion looks like. And so what we're seeing is diffusion of FeO, CaO, and chromium between chondrules and matrix primarily. So it's going out of the matrix and into the chondrules. So here is what happens specifically with chromium in, uh, in the olivine during metamorphism. Chromium is very, very sensitive to metamorphism at the very earliest stages of metamorphism. If you look, again, these are backscatter electron images, the one of Simarcona here, what you might see, it might be a little hard to see, uh, you might notice that it's a little bit brighter around the edges and darker in the interior. That's chromium being higher around the edges and lower in the interior. And again, that's a that typical igneous profile. As we increase the metamorphism, particularly if we get to this point here, uh, we see that the chromium is very high around the edges, migrating to the edges. But also, you'll notice that there are bright lines and in the interiors of the olivine grains. It kind of looks molted, molted. And that's the chromium that's actually starting to physically separate from the olivine. And so chromium actually, actually physically separates from the olivine and the chondrules and becomes pieces of chromite. 
It turns into the mineral chromite, which then resides in the matrix. But this is all happening by petrologic type 3.2, so very, very, very early. You can see again with histograms how that compositional change will look. So again, a wide range of chromium at low petrologic types becoming much more constrained at higher petrologic types. And so chromium is so sensitive to metamorphism that we've actually used it to divide those petrologic subtypes into even smaller petrologic subtypes. So now we have 3.0, 3.05, 3.10, 3.15, and then back to 3.2. So we basically subdivided 3.0 and 3.1 into smaller um, areas. And so it's pretty uh, incredible to think that it's so sensitive to metamorphism that we can constrain it that much. Another thing that's happening during metamorphism, going back to that chondral mesostasis, is that the composition of the mesostasis is also changing. And this, again, is due to diffusion. Um, at low degrees of metamorphism, the mesostasis is made primarily of isotropic glass and a little bit of magnesium-rich olivine. And that turns into sodium plagioclase during metamorphism. That change is usually made by about petrologic type 3.4. So the glass turns into plagioclase, the olivine disappears. There are a couple of different ways we know that this is happening. We can look at cathodoluminescence images, which is what you're looking at here. Uh, cathodolu cathodoluminescence is a visible light that's emitted from minerals in response to an electron beam. And so different minerals will emit a different color light. Glass is yellow, olivine is red, and then sodium plagioclase is blue. So we can look at unmetamorphosed or unequilibrated chondrules. We would see a lot of uh, red and yellow um, or either a little bit of red and blue, but by the time we get to about petrologic type 3.4, it's all blue because it's all changed to glass. Um, the, the distribution of the alkali elements, sodium and potassium in the mesostasis are also changing during the early stages of metamorphism because of this re recrystallization of albite. Albite is uh, one of the primary elements in the mineral plagioclase. These x-ray maps here are illustrating the distribution of potassium and sodium, or sodium and potassium, in the mesostasis of a few very unmetamorphosed chondrules. The sodium is blue and the potassium is red. And so you can just see that there is a, 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 a wide distribution of those elements at early stages of metamorphism. And again, the composition of the mesostasis would be changing and it would be uh, turning into plagioclase as we increase metamorphism. Look at the matrix, what's happening to the matrix? Well, one thing that's happening to the matrix is it's losing iron because it's going into the chondrules. Another thing that happens in the matrix is it loses sulfur. Uh, these images here are X-ray maps of CO chondrites. And so sulfur at high abundances is pink and white. And so at the lowest degrees of metamorphism, you see a lot of very, very fine grain sulfide or sulfur, sorry, in the matrix. And at higher degrees of metamorphism, like in Felix and Isna, uh, that sulfur is actually physically separated and turned into grains of sulfides. And so we have these round sulfide grains. And then very quickly, the last thing, there's also a change in the composition of the metal. And again, this is also diffusion driven. Um, the primary metal in ordinary chondrites or, or meteorites in general is taenite and kamosite, which have various compositions of nickel and iron metal, but they're both iron rich. And so the concentrations of cobalt in the chamosite increases during metamorphism and becomes more uniform. Um, and during metamorphism, the nickel is actually diffusing out of the kainite and into tainite. So we have compositional changes in uh, the tainite and the kainite as well, the chamosite. So just lastly, I just wanna give you an idea of what kind of temperatures and timing is associated with this. And this would be different for, for every body, every, every different parent body for the different groups. Uh, for ordinary chondrites, most studies agree that peak temperatures are probably a little less than 1200 degrees. This particular study looked at uh, constraining the temperature range between different degrees of metamorphism. And so they suggested that the boundary basically between type 6 and type 5 is 1140 K, so that's Kelvin. 1000 degrees K between four, I mean, sorry, between petrologic type 5 and petrologic type 4 and then 800 degrees K between four and three. Um, in terms of timing, there, this was all done with thermal, thermal modeling. So using actual chondrites to get some constraints and then doing thermal modeling on the computer. 
uh, they suggested that the accretion time for a body like this of this size and temperature was probably about 0.2 million years, uh, but certainly no longer than 0.5 million years. And the size of this particular body, which apparently is very difficult to constrain using these techniques, was about 130 kilometers. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, the, what the timing and the temperatures of metamorphism, metamorphism would be, but again, different in all of the different bodies. So I'm gonna go ahead and in there, there's a lot more you could say, but I wanna just introduce the concepts. And so then I'll open up the rest of the talk to questions. So, but thank you very much for your attention. What can you tell us about uh, type seven? Type seven, yeah. So there are a handful of samples that uh, are classified as type seven. And I think that classification really didn't become around until probably the, the 90s maybe. So it's a little bit more recent. Um, so with type sevens, it's a little trickier. We don't know necessarily if it's just thermal metamorphism or if it might be uh, a little bit of extra shock metamorphism raising the temperature. But in type seven, the way you can distinguish a type seven is you actually start to see that granoblastic texture that you would see in a terrestrial rock. Um, so you don't, you don't see that actually in most thermal metamorphosed chondrites, even at type six. So type seven is at even higher temperatures, but there's a small, it's only a small handful of samples that have been classified as a type seven. What's the, what's the feature of the texture at that? It's that, it's that granoblastic texture. Uh, so the image I showed where the grains are all about the same size uh -huh. and they all come together at that 120 degree triple junction. Oh, so they're the all right junction. against each other. That's characteristic of a type seven. Also, Nick, uh, Tim McCoy once suggested that uh, orthopyroxene with over 1% CAO was characteristic of type seven. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions for Tasha? I have some if nobody else wants to go in. I'm sure you do. Um, yeah, this is Steve Dash. I'm trying to find everyone on the screen. Um, hi, Steve. Hi. Um, that was a really educational talk and I, um, I, I'm glad to appreciate the role of chromium. I didn't know that before, but um, I was wondering about the statement that pressures on asteroids are never high. Of course, on asteroids, they aren't very high but we have examples of uh, clasts that seem to have been metamorphosed at several GPA pressures. Um, there's a paper by Kimura et al. Uh, and uh, another one by Abru et al, or just Abru. In 2013, they're finding omphacite and garnet, which uh, kind of indicates a planetary origin or something. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I don't know uh, a lot about that. I've heard a little bit about the discovery of, of omphacite and those are, those are, those are high pressure phases. So you, you find those in Earth and you think to yourself that there was a lot of pressure involved in this. Um, so I don't know if that would be perhaps associated with some kind of impact event where it would be something that you could get higher pressure. But, you know, within the body itself, there's just really not a significant amount of pressure because these are such small bodies. So I would think, and Alan may know a little bit better, but I would think that there would have to be an additional force. Um, providing that extra pressure to get uh, to get those high temperature phases, and so they've been they have been found in a, in a, in a few different samples. I don't think it's extremely common, um, but I would think it might be associated with, uh, with with an impact event, perhaps. So maybe it's maybe it's more of a shock metamorphism feature. Yeah, I know. I think these were supposed to be more uh, equilibrium and not so shocked, but um, okay. it's a mystery. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Steve, I wanted to say that the. Uh, Amphiboles that they found in a few of these archondrites uh, really do seem to be formed at fairly high uh, pressures at depth. And I tried my best to find a way around it to have it formed by shock, but I failed. And I had to conclude with the original authors that indeed it must have formed at some substantial depth uh, at high uh, GPA and, uh, and in a lot of water. Like what, what pressures? I can't remember. Uh, you can contact me later, and I'll okay. I have Thank you. on it, and I'll, I'll give you the citation. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. So any there's, other questions? There's some questions in the in the chat, Alan. You want me to read the questions that are in the oh, chat? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. So there's a question that says, "How large are these meteorites, and how heavy?" Uh, the size of a meteorite when it lands on the Earth is is going to vary. Um, but most meteorites are relatively small, like maybe hand-sized. There are certainly ones that are much larger. But they do break up a lot when they enter the Earth's atmosphere. And so often you'll get a lot of smaller pieces. 
but relatively small. And they're not any heavier than a terrestrial rock. And so you would not pick this up and think to yourself that this is a heavy rock. So it would feel just like any kind of rock you were picking up on Earth. Uh, there's a, a question from Martin Cole that says, why are the CAIs and iron inclusions of regular shapes, but only the chondrules reflect condensation from droplets? Uh, that's because CAIs uh, and, the, and those inclusions form directly from solids, so or they go from gas to solid. And so the specific spherical shape of a chondral reflects that liquid to solid state. But if you go from a gas to a solid, you're going to make these irregular shapes. They look like kind of flakes. Like imagine... Um, like snow, if you have big, you know, flakes of snow, uh, it, it looks a little crystalline, but it's very irregular in shape. And it's because it's, a, it's going from, you know, it's becoming a solid. And would you expect any metamorphism inside the asteroids which are being sampled and are rubble piles on the surface? Not sure if I understand the first part of the question, would you expect any metamorphism inside the asteroids which are being sampled? Um, I think if you're, if you're asking, can we sample that highest degree of metamorphism, we certainly can. It depends on the, the, the I size. I think you're talking about like Hayabusa, like Itakawa from the Hayabusa missions and things like that. I, and, I still. And, and Ryugu and things like that. The, the, the rubble piles that have undergone you know, sampling, do we expect to find metamorphosed material among the samples that we oh, get. Oh, on the surface. We expect to see metamorphosed material on the surface. If it's a rubble pile, certainly you absolutely could if it's a metamorphosed asteroid. Um, Itakawa and uh, Itakawa is a metamorphosed asteroid. Um, so you certainly hypothetically could, right? Because when you break that object apart and recreate it together, then all the material is in different locations. So it would be very easy in that case to have highly metamorphosed petrologic type material on the surface. Do I agree that uh, uh, that CVs and CKs are from the same parent parent body? That's what I've been. That's what I work on most. <laughs> most of my like the first several years of my career has been asking uh, that question. I've been arguing for uh, for a long time that I think they come from two different parent bodies. Uh, there's some chromium isotope data that supports that, but I did recently find a sample that I think looks like it might be a CV and a CK chondrite and a diffusion boundary. And if that's the case that formed on the same asteroid. So, but I haven't had a chance to, to study that yet, but um, I do think it would be difficult. The chemistry I think is difficult to get them from the same asteroid. Alan has a different, a different opinion on that, but so I'm not, I'm not exactly sure yet, but I still, still kind of lean towards them being different. No, my, uh, my opinion is jumps from one to the other. So I, yeah. I'm not gonna be uh, very <laughs> hard on that. Yeah, um, so, but yeah, so we, we keep going back and forth on that, but I've been convinced, very convinced that they were different asteroids, but like I said, since, um, since finding this new sample, getting my hands on this new sample, it looks very much to me like it's a CV and CK chondrite with a diffusion boundary, which would have, they would have to be from the same body. So once I have a chance to look at that, I'll be able to answer that question for sure, but um, still, I'm, I'm, I'm leery of the idea, but it's certainly possible. Tasha, this is Mindy. Hey, Just Mindy. real quick. Um, I was kind of hoping for a cage fight between you and uh, Alan when I saw that question pop up. <laughs> okay, sorry, that was just my one comment. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, like Alan said, we we kind of he's got to go back. Let me it briefly. My mind has changed on these things back and forth because it isn't clear cut, uh, and we have to keep an open mind. I mean, the chromium isotope data suggests two different groups. Uh, Tasha's uh, data on, on the opaques, resonant. Yeah, the uh, magnetite. The magnetite indicates mm -hmm. there's non-overlapping or essentially mm -hmm. non-overlapping compositional distributions there. But whether that could be due to different parent bodies or whether it's due to metamorphism is unclear. Um, it, my initial reaction was that the CV, if, if something was less metamorphosed, we called it a CV. If it looked more metamorphosed, we automatically call it a CK, suggesting one parent body. And then there's features in some of the CKs that looks like they could be igneous rims and CAIs, which have just been metamorphosed and therefore the petrographic differences uh, may be just due to metamorphism on one parent body. But uh, I, I don't know. And projects that I've suggested to work on with Tasha is this very fun to uh, look at some of the enigmatic meteorites to see if we can shed a little bit more light on the subject. Yeah, yeah, we've got a couple coming that, uh, that Alan and I are going to work on together that are, are really interesting. And I think eventually we'll come to an answer, but it just, it, it, 
yeah, it is a little uh, perplexing at this point. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure anymore, really. Have you looked at the cosmic ray exposure ages of the two groups and see if they're- I think they're basically the same. I think someone uh, pointed that. I think Kurt, okay. uh, Greg Kurtzoff pointed that to me, out to me. It's about, they're about the same, so. Okay, we, if we, well, let me ask you, read one question from the um, sure. chat, which I think I'd like you to address right away, because this is one that we all get from time to time. And again, is it possible that aqueous alteration that you see in some of these things occurred on Earth rather than on the asteroid parent body? Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't study aqueous alteration, but I, I, I think that we feel pretty comfortable in knowing that it occurred on the asteroid itself because it's so extensive. Um, there is certainly a terrestrial alteration. So like alteration in an object when it lands on the surface, particularly if it's in a desert, there are, you know, to like weather terrestrial weathering veins, for example, that we see. So we do see evidence of some alteration that we're pretty sure came from Earth. But again, it's a very, it's a very mild alteration um, and typically not very extensive. The aqueous alteration seems to be, it's very, very prolific. And it seems like something that would have had to occur on the parent body just because it is so extensive. So I don't think that there's an argument about that, but perhaps maybe there is. I, I feel like we're pretty certain it's, it's parent body in origin um, or either in the, the, so maybe some changes in the nebula perhaps, but certainly um, solar system and not terrestrial. I just wanted to add that when we look at metallic iron nickel grains, uh, weathered on earth, they form this uh, gutite, uh, this, uh, iron hydroxide around them. But when we see those in asteroids, uh, they seem to be magnetized. Like we see that in CR1s, for example. And we don't seem to see metal formation into magnetite on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, OK, go ahead, Tasha. You can read a couple more. And uh, go ahead. Yeah, Larry's got his hand up, so I'll, I'll go to Larry. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. Tash, Tasha? Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, hi. Um, Larry. I, um, Wanted to know more about that one asteroid that's kind of cigar shaped and it's in a different entire orbit than all the other asteroids are. And they think it came from another solar system or something. And it passed by about a couple of years back. Yeah. You know about it. I know the one you're thinking of. It's because it's, it's flat almost. Um, yeah, about 900 feet long or so. Extra solar. I honestly don't know very much about that. I don't know that we know a lot about it either because we just imaged it. And so we, we, we have very little data, just imaging data. Um, so I don't know if we know what it's made of at all. If anybody has any guesses, I'm not sure if you want to know. <laughs> What's that? Here, and I've been having a raging debate over Twitter about this. Yeah. Um, we have a paper in review, it's almost accepted, but um, it, it's almost certainly nitrogen ice. Okay. Wow. So, Steve, you don't think it's uh, uh, in, in uh, a spacecraft from another uh, intelligent civilization like the <laughs> former director of Harvard's astronomy department so declares? Um, I do not. <laughs> and I have many thoughts, which I will not share here. <laughs> okay, By the uh, way, that, that uh, thing is called uh, anyway, we're, we're, Umuamua. We're, 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 yeah, oh, that's it's, right. it's uh, yeah. about 3.30. I know there's more questions. And, uh, but we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, and if you have additional questions, uh, feel free to email them to Juliet and uh, she can go and pass them on and uh, maybe uh, Tasha can ask them. But Juliet, why don't you just uh, finish up now, please? Yes, I'm going to, first of all, thank you, Tasha, for your lecture, it was fantastic. Um, I'll put my email momentarily in the chat for anyone that has other questions that they'd want me to forward to Tasha. And I wanted to introduce our next lecture, which will be at the same time, 2.30 p.m. Pacific time on March 21st. And it'll be Dr. Rhiannon Main from Texas Christian University. And her title is Charmed, I'm sure, Meteorites as Objects of Cultural Importance. It's a little bit different than what we've covered before, but it should be very interesting. Mm. So thank you everyone for joining and feel free to I'll drop my email in the chat if anyone has any other questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank everybody. You all. Thanks, Bye, Tasha. Tasha.